Greetings, everybody. My name is Rob Jackson, founder of Ajama Lighting. Now, this is our Ajama Spotlight, where we honor African-Americans who have contributed substantially in their fields of endeavor. Today, we're both blessed and privileged to have the co-inventor of the personal PC, Dr. Mark Dean. And you heard me correctly, a black man co-invented the first computer. A lot of people don't know that. Now, Dr. Dean was born and raised in Jefferson City, Tennessee. He graduated from the University of Tennessee. And after that, he went on to have an over 30 year tenure at IBM. Now at IBM, he accomplished a lot to say the very least. He was the very first African-American uh, elected to be an IBM fellow, which, which is the highest technological achievement one can reach at the company. And he either invented or developed the following. The ISA bus, which allows us to add peripheral devices onto the personal PC, um, the first color monitor, and also the first one gigahertz computer processing chip. Shout out to the gamers who uh, uh, appreciate that invention. Now, in 1997, he was elected into the National uh, Inventors Hall of Fame. And in 2001, he was elected into the National Academy of Engineers. Now, these days, he's not, no longer with IBM. Uh, he's doing something a little bit different. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Tennessee's Department of Engineering and Computer Sciences. So without any further ado, please allow me to introduce you to Dr. Mark Dean. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hi, Rob, how are you? I'm making it. And uh, first and foremost, before we even get started, uh, I gotta say this. Um, uh, for those that don't know, I used to work for IBM. That was my first 13 years in the business. And uh, I worked at IBM Tucson. And Dr. Mark Dean was one of my first mentors at the company. So when I first started Ujama Lighting, the first thing I said is some kind of way I got to reconnect with Dr. Dean because he inspired me so much in, in IBM Tucson. So thank you so much for joining me today. Well, congratulations on Ujama Lighting. Thank you so what much. What a success story. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I'm not going to take up too much of your time today, but I want to start from the beginning. Technology. What was your first introduction into technology and, and what sparked your interest in the field? Well, my father was a tinkerer and builder, repairer of things. And so I got my first, uh, I guess, education in building stuff, uh, working with him. He built a tractor from scratch. He built an amplifier. This was an old tube base amplifier that, that he built. He built a receiver. And so I got my hands dirty working around him. Uh, my first car was a 1947 Chevrolet that we re rebuilt. He also rebuilt a 31 Dodge. So, um, so yeah, I, I think I was, uh, you know, very interested in taking things apart and putting them back together. And I was good at math. And so those two things together kind of led me into engineering. Okay. Yeah. I remember you had an affinity for uh, muscle cars. I do. <laughs> and I you do. still do. Okay. So that's I what I still came do. From. Yeah. I'm, oh, working, do. I'm working on a 63 Carvette right now. Nice. My dream car is uh, um, anything in the 60s in regards to the Chevelle. Yeah. I like Chevelle. <laughs> One of those I, do. Oh. I, I had a 67 and I wish I still had it, but I'm, I'm actually hoping I can find another Chevelle, especially a convertible. Exactly. Definitely. So is it safe to say that your dad was one of your first inspirations? He was. He, okay. was, uh, he was my first and still is my primary in, uh, inspiration. He is funny. I, I always tell people that if my father grew up during the time I grew up, he would have had twice as many achievements as I had. He's just that good. OK, yeah, especially. And um, I was going to ask you, since we both worked for IBM before, I have a lot of fun memories of IBM Tucson and IBM Austin. I'm in Austin, Texas right now. Oh, OK, um, I'm not working for IBM. I'm working for the VA right now, right. Um, nine to five. But um, I have a lot of fun memories. What are some of your fondest memories working for IBM as a whole? Because you were there a, a couple of years longer than I was. Yeah, I was there a while. <laughs> um, I would tell you that obviously the most fun I had was working on the original IBM PC in those 10 years that we developed uh, the first, you know, groupings of the, I, what was the IBM personal computer family. Uh, the team we had together was, uh, was just uh, 
one of those accidents that happened that was wonderful type of accident. You, very rarely do you get a team of people like we had together and be able to, you know, make things happen. It was, it, you know, you, you look forward to uh, the next team that comes together just like that, just like that team. So I got spoiled because we had some uh, marvelous teammates. We had fun together. And during those days, we, we just couldn't do anything wrong. Everything we did seemed to come out just right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, of all of the inventions that you have, you have over 20 patents. Um, what was the one that was the most rewarding and the one that was most challenging? Right. Well, I have 40, more than 40 patents now. So nice. I, I'm, I'm nice. still working on them. I would, you know, it's funny. Um, I cherish my, what my innovations more than my inventions. I remember Nick D'Onofrio would always say, um, innovation is the application of invention. And I enjoy applying uh, what has been discovered to solve problems or, or go after opportunities. So I always get a lot more joy from watching people use what I've done, So, which means you've taken an invention and moved it into something that is practical. And, and that's what that's what I get you know, my, my most joyful from. I would, the ISA bus obviously was probably the most valued invention that I brought to bear or innovation I brought to bear. It, uh, it lived for about 15 years and eventually got replaced by PCIe and USB and Bluetooth and all these other modern uh, interfaces. Yeah. But it lived a long time and we were actually surprised that it was uh, per pervasive for such a long time. Yeah, it's it's funny you say that because without that, I wouldn't be able to use this right here. <laughs> That's yeah, to it, it, it did it did enable a lot of other things to happen. I, I'm, I'm most proud of the fact that we actually were able to create an industry. And that's that's the one thing that made the biggest difference is we allowed other people to build to the specifications that we had published. And, um, and people took advantage of that. And they not only build identical systems, but they also build accessories to the base system. And that created a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it sure did. Um, so when I think back to my career at IBM, um, you, you helped me a lot, especially, I met you at an earlier part of my career. Uh, I was unseasoned, I was kind of, you know, this this backwoods country boy coming into IBM <laughs> that just graduated from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and lacking confidence um, and whatnot. And you were the one that kind of kind of instilled a lot of the confidence in me. And I wish I could go back in time to my first day and, and, and take some of the lessons that you taught me. I was going to ask you, uh, was there in your earlier days with IBM, is there anything you would have done differently? Well, you know, we always consider whether the stuff we uh, had done, if we could go back, could we fix the, the things that we did wrong? Yeah. And I tell people that if I could go back and do it all over again, I'd probably do everything exactly the same because it kind of came out, came out right. I mean, I can't complain on how it actually came out and I wouldn't want it to come out any differently. So yeah, I made a lot of mistakes. I made 10 times more mistakes than I saw successes. I was able to deal with those mistakes quickly enough so, to where they didn't escalate into a real set of problems. And to be honest, the goodness that we brought to bear from the work that we did kind of overshadowed the, a lot of the, what we would call errata that came out of some of the development that we did. So. My grandfather would always say that if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. And so yeah. I made a lot of mistakes and I did a lot of learning. Fortunately, I was able to learn fast enough to cover up some of those mistakes and produce something that had some value. I totally agree. I'm, I'm learning that the hard way as an entrepreneur is that I, I've made so many mistakes in my 17 month tenure with my company. <laughs> and I tell new people who want to become an entrepreneur, the same thing is that you're going to make those mistakes, but uh, the boss is not going to fire you. It's that is right. right. You're the <laughs> and you're still doing it. So it must be working. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've learned more from my mistakes than my uh, successes. Oh, so yeah. I definitely understand. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. In fact, it's hard to learn anything from a success because you, you you've already done it uh, right. So. 
that is just a repeat. You know, a success is something that you do that, you know, it comes out good. So there's not much other people may learn from your success, but uh, the individual doesn't learn from their own success. They learn from the mistakes they make. Definitely. Definitely. Now, right now, you're a distinguished engineer at the University of Tennessee, right? Um, well, to be honest, uh, since we've talked, I retired from the University of Tennessee. Oh, have you? Yeah. So I'm I'm running my own little consultancy and trying to help people figure out how to leverage technology to differentiate their business. OK, well, I know you always had, a, had an affinity for teaching. You told me that. I so I, I, I always knew that you were going to eventually teach in some capacity. Now, and I, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed working with the students. Uh, the fact is the young people have no constraints. They will try just about anything. Anything's possible. And I love working in that environment where, you know, everybody thinks, yeah, we can do this. Why not? Let's try it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, um, even back when I was uh, younger in college, um, they have so much access to technology now. I mean, you have access to all of the world's knowledge right here, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that it has, what, what are some of the uh, the things you see that are different in this generation that has access to all of this power versus what 10, 20 years ago? Do you see anything different in how they approach things in technology? No, I don't really see. I think they uh, obviously can do more because they have more at their fingertips. And to be honest, there's a lot more opportunity for them than what I saw back when I started, just because there's so much more going on, right? The, there's breakthroughs pending in biology that leverages computing technology to do modeling and simulation so that you know what's going to happen and understand how diseases uh, work, for example. Uh, there's, you know, the, we just recently saw that this, this space race, this new space race that's happening, a lot of opportunity there. We just switched over from incandescent lighting to LED lighting, and that's still booming. But the funny thing about it is for all of the stuff that's happening, there's there's a lot more to be discovered and a lot more to be invented. So we there's still tons of opportunity out there to make a difference in the world. Yeah. Um, in my capacity as a founder of uh, my company, I've spoken to some students and, and I kind of usually gravitate towards the IT students because that's just my background. Um, and a lot of them have ideas um, that they've confided to, to me and that they want to actually achieve some invention worthy ideas. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them don't know what to do. And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I have a few patterns that went back when I was at IBM. IBM made it simpler because they did the process for you. Mm -hmm. I'm learning with my new company that, you know, uh, it actually costs a lot of money to file patents. It does. <laughs> and I it's pretty much free for us. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the advices you have for these young innovators? How do they get started? How do they set themselves apart from the rest? Well, I tell people that uh, the only, just about anything you can imagine can be built. Uh, there's nothing I haven't, I've imagined that hasn't yet proven to be impossible to do. The only thing that tends to get in the way is uh, really three main factors and a fourth. It's time, money, risk, and the willingness to just continue to drive until you see success. Um, and so I tell students that there's going to be a lot of people that tell you you can't do something because it's never been done before. One is you can't let that slow you down. You may find that it's difficult and you might discover that there are other ways that you need to go about it. The first way probably won't be the right way. But if you believe that you have something that's unique, um, keep at it. I mean, most of my ideas, maybe they were a little bit too far-fetched, but most of them took five years for them to come to fruition. And, um, and I haven't always benefited from having those ideas because I have, just haven't had time to work on them. But there's still much more. Uh, that can be done, uh, simple things that can be done. I think it just is a matter of trying, you know, to make it happen, finding a way to make it happen and making sure you leverage more than yourself. Uh, all of the great things I've ever done included a team of people. You know, nothing I did that saw any success was done in a vacuum by myself. 
it always required thinking and doing and ideas from other people. And I think the key thing I learned and something my grandfather also said is that, you know, uh, there are a lot of right ways to do something. All you have to do is find one and get on with it. Don't battle over who idea gets implemented because in the long run, the only thing people will remember is that you got something done. That's the only thing they'll they'll understand. They won't they won't remember who whose idea did what and who owned it. Blah blah blah. All they'll know is what you were involved with something that made a difference. And so you know it's not you don't have to just use your own ideas to get things done. You can depend on others as well to help you get things done. Yeah, I totally agree. Teamwork does make the dream work. And um, mm -hmm. that was that was one of my biggest challenges as well, because I'm naturally introverted. Yeah, um, me too. I'm, you are too. Me too. And, and I, I like doing things by myself because I feel like I can depend on myself, but you just can't get a lot of substantial things done without a team. Um, no, you can, you can lead by example. You can uh, express your ideas in a way that convinces people that, yeah, this makes some sense. Let's try it. And so one of the things I learned, and I learned this as IBM, is communication skills is probably the most important skill a inventor can have. Because if you can't communicate your ideas to others and have them understand why it's a good idea, most great inventions will go for naught. Right, they just people just won't get it. And so you have to practice, although it was hard for me, practice on your communication skills. Because um, if you notice, a salesman, a good salesman can sell you a pair of dirty socks. And and they're just good at it. And they make you feel good that you bought those dirty socks. So I don't want to sell dirty socks, but I want to at least be able to communicate my good ideas to people, convince them that yes, at least worth something to talk about. Okay, yeah. Well, during my time talking to a lot, a lot of students, um, they also talked about entrepreneurship because they always ask, okay, well, you have a black owned lighting company. I've never heard of a black owned LED lighting company. Mm -hmm. So they asked me, um, so they are very interested in that. Uh, I was going to ask you about entrepreneurship a little bit about what, uh, what's your take on entrepreneurship and its role on um, kind of bridging the wealth gap, especially in the minority communities? Right. Well, entrepreneurship is probably the key to many people's success uh, because that's probably the only way in many cases that an idea that a person has is going to happen. Right. Oftentimes, if you're not committed to your own ideas to a point where you're willing to take the risk and and, you know, put your all into it. Uh, most other people won't opt in. So that means entrepreneurship is going to be one of the keys to the success of many uh, young people, um, including the black uh, population. Uh, I think, um, you know, there's, there's some new ways of acquiring the kinds of funding you need to support an entrepreneurial approach. Uh, the key is that you just have to keep at it. I mean, I've noticed that um, most entrepreneurs, they'll ask, you know, tens of people, tens of different people to try to get funding to support their their interests. And you can't, you're going to get a lot of no's. You can't let that stop you. You have to keep, keep at it. And in fact, you're going to fail two or three times or, or more. Yeah. Um, the statistics say one in 10 new businesses are successful. And so that means you got to be swinging at the, at the ball a lot to get a hit. But when you get the hit, it'll get, it gets easier. After that first hit, that second hit comes closer. It's, it's easier to get the second hit and the third hit. And so that's why you see some of the more successful entrepreneurs, they find a way to repeat and repeat again and repeat again. And they're, you know, they're more likely to be successful the second time around, third time around, fourth time around, because they've learned so much the early on in their tries. Definitely, definitely. You, you definitely have to fail forward 
I believe. Right. You have you have to jump and build build the plane on the way down. I I, I definitely do agree with that. Yeah. Um, I've seen that with my business as well. Yeah. Um, it's a challenge. But one thing I noticed because I've had some. Like I said, in the 17 months I've been uh, Ujama Lighting, we had to have a name change because of trademarking issues. That scared me. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I noticed is that if you keep swinging, the universe tends to get out of your way. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, you will be amazed at how much something you think this this catastrophic it actually fixes itself if you keep trying. Yep. So I totally agree with that. Yep. Now. Definitely. I'm, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I have one more question for you. Uh, I asked you this good grief, 15 years ago when I first talked to you, because I know uh, people who have innovative minds, master inventors such as yourself, you're thinking a mile a minute. And I remember the first question I asked you, what do you do to de-stress? What do you do to calm down? How do you mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you maintain yourself in all of this sanity? Well, I hope I told you that one of the important things is you should always have a hobby. Yeah, you should have something that's a distraction, something that uh, takes your mind off of, of what you're doing. Mine is cars, building cars, restoring cars. To be honest, I also love electronics. I love uh, computing. I love building things. And so, um, you know, that was relaxing uh, as well to me. Uh, I also had a great partner in my life. Uh, she's made sure that I um, have enough distractions to keep me sane. Maybe also it keeps her sane. But it's, you know, there are a lot of things, a lot of ways to relax, uh, a lot of ways to get stuff off your mind, to clear your head so you can think uh, about things, bring new ideas to the table. You got to find those ways. Hiking is great, especially in Tucson. Hiking was another great one. You could go out just in your back back of your house, take a two three mile hike, come back, you're ready to go, right? So you just gotta. It's different for everybody. Uh, you just have to find that. That's why I always ask people when I interview them uh, for a job. I ask them, okay, what's your hobbies? What's your distractions? What what takes your mind off of that problem? that yes. you're having trouble solving. And uh, oftentimes, to be honest, in our profession, in technology, a lot of times it's music. I mean, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of disciplines, engineering disciplines and math disciplines, uh, people also are musicians. And yeah. so you, you'll get 60 to 70% of the people will have some kind of musical in, interaction that will help them uh, with a you know, clearing their heads. Well, you mentioned that you're still um, very interested in technology. Quick question, because technology keeps continues to change. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the one of some of the biggest uh, innovation opportunities we have right now? What do you think we're headed in regards to computing and technology? Well, uh, I th computing's a tool now. It's kind of like a hammer or a shovel. Now people use it to do stuff. Right, you use a, sh a shovel in its own right is all is good for digging ditches or digging holes, right? And that's what you use a shovel for. Um, there's very little incremental innovation in the shovel, but it's still a valuable tool. Computing is kind of there. We've kind of reached the end of Moore's law. We've, uh, you know, computing hasn't changed from a performance standpoint in a long time, uh, to be honest, was just because silicon has kind of reached the limit. We still put more transistors on the chip, uh, but if, from a performance standpoint, uh, we're using other methods, you know, parallelisms to make things work. So I think uh, the breakthroughs will be in the use of computing to discover other things. Biology, for example, medicine is a good example. Lots of discoveries in that area that's just pending. I think we're, there's gonna be a lot of things breaking through. I, I'm a little bit biased to bioengineering as the next big breakthrough engineering discipline. I think there's a lot that's gonna, gonna happen there. Uh, I think in the area of uh, using engineering to help us deal with climate change, it's gonna be another one, computing analytics to help us understand where we are and where we're going and ways of uh, resolving that. I think that's another big area, the use of electric uh, cars and 
electric trucks and you know semi electric semis and all it's going to be another big deal and people are working on that we still have a, a lot of breakthroughs i tease people about uh, the things that we continue to use that you would have thought would have been replaced by now things like the keyboard you know you would have thought after what almost 100 years since the typewriter the keyboard would have by somebody would have found a way to input information that's more efficient than our fingers punching buttons but we still use our fingers punching buttons to put in information isn't it crazy i mean if you say it that way cuz that's all a keyboard is is a bunch of buttons and and you and you're limited by your 10 fingers on how much data you can put in that, that's a crazy thought but so there's still some breakthroughs that need to happen in maybe the user interface uh, for example, I, I would love to have, I, I've actually talked to people about uh, a pair of glasses that would pop up information about my surroundings as I'm in there because the technology is kind of there. So you could have a camera and do um, recognition of the people and, and things around you. And on the, on the front of your glasses, it could just pop up information about what's going on, like your birthday and you, you know who you're married to and or have you had any you know successes recently I, that all would pop up right in front of me and i could talk to you about stuff and you would wonder you'd be wondering how in the heck would, does mark know of all that about me and it, it's all flashing in front of me on my, on my glasses I, I i'd love to see that build it the technologies it's kind of a augmented reality approach but with normal looking glasses is uh i think that'd be a great breakthrough i'm waiting I'm wondering if I can do that, and uh, but I, I know people should be working on something like that, especially for re repair work. You know, me working on an engine or a technician working on an engine and have the engine plans pop up in front of them and tell them what part goes where and the part number and stuff like that, and they don't have to, you know, look at a book or, or take the tools out of their hands. They can just keep right on working. Okay, young inventors and innovators take note. Yeah, right. <laughs> Some of the I don't want to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, Dr. Dean, thank you so much again. It was it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, we appreciate you and um, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Rob. And I wish you <laughs> continued success in your lighting business. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Hold the line and I'll talk to you in just a second. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, my name is Rob Jackson. Um, I'm gonna try to do this periodically, uh, our Ajama Spotlight. So send, me, send in uh, your suggestions of who you want me to talk to um, and I'll try to get it done. Until then, stay blessed, stay focused uh, and stay united. Everybody take care. <laughs>